Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we love you, and I just pray that you'll bring this word alive. Lord, let it cut going in and cut coming out as a double-edged sword. Let it lift those that are down and bless those that need blessing. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Those of you that know my preaching know that I find it very hard to get out of Genesis. It is the beginning of it all. And if you get Genesis wrong, thank you. Then you get the rest of the Bible wrong. This is the foundation. Chapter 4. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I bought forth a man. By the way, that is just as correctly translated. I have bought forth the man. Clearly, she thinks she's had the Messiah. She is thinking to herself that God has promised that there was going to come one that would crush the head of the serpent. And she says, I have bought forth the man. She's clearly thinking Cain is the peaches and cream. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. By the way, many Bible commentators put these two together and call them twins. Nothing in the text to indicate that they're twins. This could have been nine months later. It could have been five minutes later. We don't know. Now Abel kept the flocks, and Cain worked the soil. Two different personalities. In the course of time, Cain bought some of the first fruits from the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel bought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his, of his stock, of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Now you may ask, how did they know one was accepted and the other was rejected? If we wanted to spend the time tracking this through, and I don't because i got a lot more to give you this morning, you would find that when God was delighted with the sacrifice, he would send the fire. As it is in churches... When God is delighted with our praise, he sends the fire, the anointing. And here he would send the fire. And they would understand that one offering had been accepted and one offering had been rejected. And many people say, well, one offering was a blood offering, a blood sacrifice, and the other one was vegetables. But that doesn't work either. Commonly taught that it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because God prescribes grain offerings <coughs> and things of that nature in the book of Leviticus. So it's not just that one is a blood sacrifice and one is not. It's the attitude with how they're given. One throws up some rotten veggies and the other, it's very clear from the text, brings fat portions of his stock or the flock. There's a difference in the heart of the giver. But Cain, on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. And then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face downcast? If you do what's right, will you not be accepted? See, he had not done what was right. But if you do not do what's right, sin is crouching at the door and it desires to have you, but you must master over it. Amen. Well, I'll tell you, nothing has changed. Amen. Sin still crouches at the door. Yes. And there are things that we still have to master over. There are things that we still have to gain the mastery over, and it's not easy. 
It is not easy. But God speaks to Cain here and he says, listen, if you do what's right, you'll be accepted. And if you don't, there is sin crouching at the door. And as I've said so many times before in the Hebrew here, it's very clear. It's, it's actually portraying a, a lion ready to pounce. And he's saying, listen, sin is like a lion ready to, ready to pounce on you. But you've got to master over it. Now Cain said his brother said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know. He replied, am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. This week, a young man went into a school in southern Texas with an assault rifle and shot to death 19 children. I could understand it if they were teenagers, but they're not. Children, little kids, third graders, and two teachers. And the world is stunned. The week before, a guy walks into a market in Boston and shoots to, get, shoots to death another nine people. And again, the world is stunned. But nobody's stunned about those that are killing Christians in Nigeria. or Pakistan, or any of those other Islamic countries. We are stunned because our press gets a hold of it, and once the press gets a hold of it, and plays it five million times, we're all devastated. But listen, murder started right here. You see, what happened was Adam and Eve sinned. And when they sinned, death came into the world. And from that time forward, the very first thing that happens, once they've had their children and their children are of age, because one we know as a farmer and one as a shepherd, they've obviously grown up at this stage. One kills the other. So much for Cain's chances at being the Messiah. He kills Abel. Murder has begun in the garden. And incidentally, it was not begun by man, it was begun by the devil. Jesus said he's a thief and a liar and a murderer, and he was a murderer from the very beginning. And then Cain picks it up. And he kills his own brother. So here's what the world says. By the way, many Canadians think like this as well. What you need to do is ban guns. Guns are the problem. Well, Cain never had a gun. Timothy McVeigh never had a gun. The guys that flew the planes into the towers never had a gun. What is the real issue? Do guns make it easier? Certainly. But think of the millions of people that are killed in cars every day. Around the world. Literally millions. We don't ban guns or cars. In the 1920s, Right after the pandemic, the 1918 pandemic of the flu, when they were uh, just coming to understand that sunlight was curing people, they would put them outside, they would take the sun, they called it taking the air or taking the sun. They would take the sun, they'd get better. How come? Because they were producing vitamin D and they didn't know it back then. But they were just getting a grip on this pandemic. 
And finally, by 1920, things had started to get riotous and people started to drink like crazy. And so the government came along in the United States and says, here's what we need to do. We need to get rid of booze. And that lasted for 13 years. Now, I don't drink at all. But having said that, it didn't work. You know what came out of that? Mixed drinks. Because what they were doing is producing such gut rot that the only way that they could stomach it was to mix it with fruity juices. So now we're not only producing alcoholics, we're producing diabetics as well. It didn't work. They tried the same thing with drugs. And look where we are now. They tried the same thing with prostitution. They've never been able to stop it. So why not just get rid of the guns? That would solve the problem. Except that the problem is not the gun or the car or the bottle, or the prostitute. The gun is the, tr the problem is the heart of man. Yes. And that's what needs dealing with. Amen. You see, when you throw God out of your schools and you throw him out of your government and you make it illegal for anyone to even wear a cross at work, What do you expect? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, it says this. So I tell you this and insist on it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do. There should be a change. When somebody comes to Christ, there should be a change in their lives. Ephesians 4, 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live like the goyim, like the Gentiles, in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separate from the life of, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to the hardening of their hearts. That's what's gone on. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Does that not describe our generation? Verse 20, you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that's in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we're all members of one body. In your anger, don't sin. By the way, you want an example of somebody who got angry and sinned? Cain. Yes. In your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down well, you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold, which incidentally indicates he's looking for some way to climb up on you. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with others in need. Don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, only what's helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you're sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Amen. See, this is how God deals with this situation. He says, when you get saved, when Christ comes into you, there must be a difference. 
If somebody can tell me they're saved and, 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 and feel no compulsion to be any different to how they were in the world, I would suggest you're not saved. If you come to Christ and he puts his spirit in you, there's a change in your heart. Something develops in you. You are a different person to the one you started out. The Bible says of him or the enemy, the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And that is exactly what we're seeing. That is exactly what is going on, not only in the United States. Don't get smug and think it can't come here. Wasn't long ago they beat Rena Virk to death. Wasn't long ago, in fact, a couple of weeks, 30 kids got around a girl and beat on her and while the rest filmed it right here. So don't think somebody couldn't pick up a gun here and wouldn't do that here because we're different. We're Canadians. We're, we're, we're cut above. No, we're not. The heart of man is still desperately wicked. Turn to Romans chapter 1 verse 21 for a minute. Romans 1, 21. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now just think about this for a second. There were eight souls that stepped off of the ark, all of them knew God. Within a generation or two, we have all kinds of paganism cropping up. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of an immortal God for the images or images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to sinful desires, uh, the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is to be praised forever. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts even their women exchanged their natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, uh, their men also abandoned their natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with one another and received in themselves penalty, a due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to depraved, a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. And they became filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, that they, uh, uh, they, pardon me, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, their gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless and faithless, heartless and ruthless. Although they know God's de decree about those that do such things, that they, they deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they approve of those that practice them. Listen, that describes our generation. I mean, it's clear as clear can be. Now let's go to the writings of Paul just for a bit of fun. We'll lighten the mood slightly. Come over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy 3, 1, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. Boy, if you ever needed evidence that the Bible is a fact, you are watching it on your news. You say, this is terrible. This kid gets teased in school. And so he goes out. And by the time he comes 18, he orders a couple of rifles online. And some ammo. And then goes back to a school with kids the same age as those that teased him. And he shoots them all to death. 
terrible. And ought we as Christians to be surprised? Or should we be looking at that and saying, it is disgusting, it's horrific, it's awful, but we ought to have seen that coming. Mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Do you know, I, I, I have somebody online that sends me selfies every day. And not one, but several selfies every day. People's will, people will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. The first thing this kid did when he got his rifle was shoot his grandmother. As I understand it, it was because she was taking up the Wi-Fi. Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, rash, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. That describes our generation. If generations before could apply that in, in some mild way, that's fine. But we live it daily. It is what CNN is built on. It is what Fox News is built on. If it bleeds, it leads. We ought not be surprised. It's what comes out of the heart that is the problem. It's not the tools that they're using. It's what is coming from the heart. Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew 15 for a moment, verse 10. Matthew 15, 10. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean. But what comes out of his mouth, that's what makes him unclean. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when, you, when they heard this? And he replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by its roots. Leave them. They're blind guides. If the blind leads the blind, both of them will fall into a pit. And Peter said, explain to us the parable. Are you so dull, Jesus asked? Don't you see that whatever enters a man's mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. And these are what makes a man unclean. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. These are what makes a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands doesn't make him unclean. You see, he's identified the real problem. The real problem is that core, that center of a man. When the Bible talks about the cardia, the heart, it's not necessarily talking about that fleshy instrument that we know and love. It's talking about the emotional center and core of a human being, the heart. We even talk like that. We talk about getting to the heart of the matter. Same kind of thinking. And Jesus said, listen, it's what comes out of the heart. That's why when Jesus comes in, he changes your heart. Amen. You are a different person than what you started out. You started out with an unclean heart, but once you came to him, listen to this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. 
Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from sin, for I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you're proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful from birth, sinful at the time my mother conceived me. Surely your desired truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the innermost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones that you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right or steadfast spirit. Create in me a clean heart. And when we come to Christ... That is exactly what he does. He creates in us a clean heart. Puts his spirit inside us. Not because we're good and not because we're perfect. But because we believe in Jesus. Because we're saved. And he gives us that change of heart. I have never believed that Christians should kill anything unnecessarily. I have no problem with believers killing in order to eat in places where there is no food. I absolutely have no problem with that. But I have a great deal of problem with people that take guns and go hunting for fun. I don't think killing should be fun for a believer. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Around him, there is no death. And so taking joy by killing greatly concerns me. And just while I'm on it, I'll go one step further and tell you, I am deeply concerned about the video games that are being made public these days. Just released to children. And when they shoot something in a video game, it bleeds and dies and part of them hardens. There's no sense of this is wicked or evil. I can enjoy every wicked thing in an imaginary world until one day that child has a snap or a break with reality and begins to carry it out in real life. Video games are so accurate, so complete, that it's just a dry run. Many people, by the way, have taught themselves to fly airplanes with a video game. Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, who can know it? I think it's just so important that we understand that the real problem here is not the guns, And I'm not making an argument for guns by any means, shape or form. I'm simply saying that's the world's view because they don't understand what the Bible actually teaches. The issue is we have taken God out of the United States. We have taken him out of Canada and we are taking him out of every country we can get our hands on. And so let's not be surprised when the heart of man begins to do what the heart of man does. It is desperately wicked. What does the world need? It needs Jesus. It needs Jesus. It needs love and mercy and forgiveness. It needs to come up and not focus on the wrong thing. Why would it be wrong to take the guns out of the states? Well, I'll tell you why. First of all, you'd never get them all. Number one, it's too late. They've all got them. When I was a little boy, just a tiny little guy, maybe seven or so years of age, I developed appendicitis in Texas. And they took me to the church, and uh, there they all prayed for me. And finally, somebody got a word from God that said, take him to the doctor for which I was very grateful, and they took me to the doctor. The doctor said, this boy has 30 minutes to live. 
and they rushed me down to Stevens Park Hospital. They got me into emergency surgery. And when I was laying there recovering, the doctor came by. This is now a day or so later. And I saw he had a gun in his belt. This is Texas. And I said, uh, is that real? He said, yeah. Here. He pulled out the clip, handed me the gun. He said, I'll be back in an hour or so. I've got to do my rounds. You, you can play with this for a while. My parents came in. I think you can see where this is going. <laughs> Dad. <laughs> Having said all of that, I am anti-gun. I am anti-violence. And I'm most certainly anti-killing. I believe that we as Christians should spread life, should spread love, should spread mercy and grace. That's who we are. That's who our God is. And don't be fooled by what the world says is a solution. Because I promise you, it's not. Will you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, you have told us not to conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. I pray right now, Father, for those families that have lost loved ones, children. Lord, the most precious of all, I pray that you would comfort them. I thank you for that little girl, Lord, that had just given her testimony that morning before being shot to death. Telling people that they needed to come to Jesus. Lord, I, I, I pray for her family. I pray for all of those families and for the families of the school teachers. Lord, in Jesus' precious name. This is indeed the terrible times your word said it would be. There will be terrible times in the last days. We know what this is. We know who is behind it. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you'd help us to realize, first of all, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And secondly, that the issue is really the heart of man. Help us as Christians to help others come to Christ. What the world needs now is Jesus. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.